AMD is launching RDNA 3. Just a mere 11 pounds of boxes here in my hands. <laughs> but the software is just as important as the hardware of this generation. AMD has made some amazing strides in terms of software, but first let's take a look at this hardware. Yes, you already know what these are. You, you clicked on the video. This is the 7900 XTX, which let's be honest, I'm a little surprised about the XTX. I figured the XTX would be coming at CES. Maybe the XTX three gigahertz edition or something like that. I mean, I think these are some of the most hotly anticipated cards from AMD that they've ever done. And AMD has been very careful so far to give us a uh, modest impression of what these cards will be. Oh my gosh, look at that. Look, look at this. Look at this madness. Look at that. Welcome to the red team, the new standard of high performance gaming. There's nothing in here except a little card and that's it. The move the FCC notices to the back of the card. It's got a nice clean back plate and look, two eight pin power connectors. So from a hardware design and interface standpoint, we have two full size DisplayPort 2.1 ports. Now this is not the full 80 gigabits of bandwidth of DisplayPort 2.1. I'll come back to that, it's 57 gigabits per second. I know a thing or two about DisplayPort from having worked on some things. <laughs> We've also got HDMI 2.1 as well as USB Type-C for VR headsets. Now USB-C is not gonna be a full DisplayPort 2.1 thing because the cabling and the connectors and everything else are not rated for data rates that high, but it is a good connection combining USB-C plus the data rate that you would need for a VR headset. So it works pretty good. Just keep that in mind if you're using a USB-C to DisplayPort adapter. Those aren't super awesome. First and foremost, two eight pin connectors. Yeah, these aren't 400 or 600 watt behemoth cards. In fact, AMD has been pretty conservative with what they tell us these cards have a board power for. Although we can see from board partner boards that there are some significantly higher wattage boards available from partners. The other big thing is that these are truly chiplets. And it's not chiplets in the, in the HBM sense or chiplets in that there's a multi-packaging technology with two graphics compute dies on, on one package as we've seen with some of the cDNA products. No, this is actually the compute die as one large piece of silicon and then you have six other pieces of silicon which are memory controllers those are the io part of it so it's sort of an opposite situation as the cpu if you look at the the ryzen chiplet desktop cpus you got a big old io die little tiny compute chiplets where the compute happens well amd has crammed all of the compute onto one giant monolithic piece of silicon it's giant at least compared to what we have in cpu land and then they've broken out the memory controller and the IO interface stuff as much as they can into six chiplets. Basically six of those chiplets, all six of them are gonna run on the 7900 XTX and the 7900 XT, you get five of the six. And I think the $100 price difference between these two GPUs suggests that AMD has a very high yield for this chiplet configuration because I have a feeling that the lower cost GPUs are not gonna be you know, four of the six or three of the six memory interfaces working, but time will tell if that prediction is correct. So the 7900 XTX, in addition to additional memory controller stuff, you have 96 RDNA 3 compute units versus 84 in the 7900 XT. That's 6144 stream processors versus 5376. The game clock is 2.3 gigahertz on the 7900 XTX. I, you know, I just, okay. I wanna do the actual game testing, but sure, sure, sure. 96 megabytes of infinity cache versus 80 megabytes, 24 gigabytes of GDDR6 versus 20 gigabytes. AMD has always erred on the side of lots of video memory and that has worked out really well for them so far. You know, when their competitors launched their next to the highest tier GPU, I was kind of surprised by their memory selection given that people with those cards and the capabilities of those cards are rocking 4K or even the ultra wide, you know, like the like the G9 Samsung, which is 5K. Okay, it's only 1440 pixels tall. It's actually less pixels than, than 4K, but still, it's a lot of pixels. 
It's a 384-bit memory interface bus, 61 teraflops, the highest end card, 355 watts for the 7900 XTX versus 300 to 315 total board power for the 7900 XT. And it'll work with an 800 watt power supply, either one of these. 750 watts recommended for the 7900 XT and 800 watts for the 7900 XTX. And with that, let's talk about the actual gaming benchmarks and the actual gaming benchmarks versus flagship competitors. Woo! Performance, 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 performance. That's gotta be top of mind if you're looking at these cards. I mean, it's $1,000 for the XTX or $900 for the XT. So these are high-end cards, but they're not, they're not as enormous. You know, 355 watts versus 315 watts total board power is a practical matter. Certainly had a lot of easier time moving them in and out of machines for doing these sorts of tests. You know, got our Fractal North here, did a video on that, check that out. It's, it's a fun case, wood grain. Smart access memory, all the performance, everything is there. You will have an absolutely fantastic 4K or 1440p or even 1080 uh, gaming experience with any of these cards. I don't think spending a thousand dollars on a graphics card if you're shooting for 1080p, even if it's 300 FPS, really makes a lot of sense. Like, I'd like to talk to you on the forum because what are you doing? I don't, I don't understand. My test system here is an LG OLED display. So this thing can do 120 Hertz and the true pixel response time of OLED is far and away better than anything else. And so really when we're talking about the performance leaps that AMD has made, like if you look at the 6950, the 6900 XT, and the 6950 XT, generation on generation, it's 30 to 45 percent real world for the games that I play. A lot of the testing and information that AMD shared ahead of time has games running at their absolute maximum settings, and maybe just like one or two notches down from there will get you significantly higher performance. So I don't necessarily personally always run with the game absolutely maxed out visually. And that's sort of reflected a little bit in our benchmarks, but they still look really good. The big improvement here is, uh, you know, there've been a lot of updates with FSR 2. So I'll start with Cyberpunk 2077. Now at Cyberpunk 2077, when we're looking at these cards and gen on gen improvement from the 6900 XT, AMD has really outdone themselves. The driver is just better. It's better for a lot of reasons, but in terms of being a graphics driver, it's better. Uh, graphics drivers are expected to do a lot more than just be a graphics driver. There's OBS integration and recording and settings optimizations and finding all kinds of stuff. We'll talk about all that in a minute. But just in terms of the driver being a driver with Cyberpunk 2077, you know, because you can do ray tracing, a lot better. Cyberpunk 2077 also added FSR 2. So DLSS versus FSR2 in Cyberpunk 2077. I really wanted to put some effort into pixel peeping the quality because, okay, let's face it, at the full resolution, the full 4K resolution running with ray tracing on ultra, it's not a super enjoyable uh, frame rate here that we're looking at with Cyberpunk 2077. But when we turn on FSR, then all of a sudden things are a lot more manageable. You know, north of 60 FPS is entirely possible with the XTX. At the top end of the spectrum is ultra performance with 80 FPS. Now at ultra performance, you're gonna notice some visual differences versus the, you know, 20-ish FPS of, you know, there's no FSR or anything going on. So with FSR dialed into quality settings, well, we can still get a perfectly playable frame rate that's still a lot better than 20-ish FPS at the full 4K with the ray tracing stuff basically maxed out. And I think this is really underscoring how far AMD has come in software. It still feels like AMD has a ways to go in software, don't get me wrong, but this is pretty good. Also, really looking closely at these frames, looking at the detail, and it's a little difficult here because sometimes different player models load in when you're looking at a benchmark scene, but the detail and fidelity, uh, see what I did there, fidelity FX, really looks shockingly good. I think that having these things on uh, for a playable frame rate sort of makes a lot of sense. And that's gonna factor in a little bit more here in a minute when I talk about the software stuff the driver does other than just the driver stuff. <laughs> what that means, what the driver does is sort of expanding and I'll, you know, I'll come back to that. So let's take ray tracing out of the equation for a second. Still with Cyberpunk 2077. 4K, 
60 FPS. Oh, okay. That's not bad. Now what about with FSR? FSR turned to a visual quality setting where I can just barely start to tell, okay, there's something going on. You can look in the lights and some other details and see there's something that's not quite as crisp, not quite as, as sharp. That's 160 FPS. I don't think I need ray tracing that bad. And if we just sneak in a little bit of a comparison here to the 4090, you know, 68 versus 86, like for like testing. Yeah, the 4090 is doing a little bit better but the 4090 is a significantly more expensive card. We're still talking about, you know, $900 to $1,000 GPUs. It's also worth noting here that the performance difference between the 7900 XT and the 7900 XTX is maybe a little bit more than AMD let on in some of their initial slides. Now, overclocking is gonna be a thing, and also partner cards are going, some, at least some of the partner cards, are gonna push the board limits a little bit beyond 355 watts of the 7900 XTX. For the efficiency curve and small form factor systems and that sort of thing, the board power being about 315 watts on the 7900 XT, genuinely very impressive, and the performance numbers are there to back it up. But at these higher resolutions with more memory bandwidth, it really depends on the game. Certain games really do like having the extra memory controller and the extra memory bandwidth that you get with the XTX over the XT. It just depends on the game. Now keep in mind, we're still talking about 4K. When we're talking about 1440p and below, if that's your target frame rate that you want to game at, the 7900 XT is going to more than tick all the boxes. Oh, it's also worth noting that when we step back for a second and we look at our comparison system benchmarks for 1440p and 4K, there really isn't a lot of difference between our 13900K and our 7950X. Our 7950X is rocking 6,000 mega transfer memory, but our 13900K is rocking that insane G-Skill 7200 kit that I got before, which is a good lead in to talk about Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So with that 7200 mega transfer kit and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, because Shadow of the Tomb Raider really likes memory bandwidth, system memory, not GPU memory, then we're talking about 322 FPS as a ceiling, and that's with our 4090. But again, these cards don't really necessarily directly compare to a 4090 because the 4090 is so much more dramatically expensive. The 7900 XTX, we can just tickle 300 FPS with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is darned impressive. And you don't need the most expensive 7200 mega transfer memory to do that. And you don't need the highest end system to do that. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the other benchmarks. So for ridiculous, insane, you know, face melting 1080p frame rates, these cards will do it. Nvidia is going to do a little bit better. Ray tracing, it still holds its edge. But for 1440p and 4K, AMD is really giving Nvidia a run for its money. And so we've only talked about two games so far. We've got more games to talk about. But my hypothesis here is that AMD really wants to capture the bulk of the market. Look at the board complexity. Like, look at the teardowns in other videos uh, from other YouTubers. Look at the teardown of the 4080. Look at the teardown of the 4090. And then look at the teardown of the 7900 XT and XTX. The boards appear to be less complicated. The cards are probably going to be cheaper to produce, which probably means they're going to have a better profit margin, even though they cost less for vendors and everybody else. If that's the case, then AMD is going to continue to take market share away as long as the software experience is good and as long as the drivers are good. Darn it, we're trying to get ahead of ourselves talking about all the driver features that have not anything to do with drivers. Let's run through the games. Borderlands 3, 4K, over 100 FPS in any configuration. It's sort of breathtaking. You can see our performance breakdown here. 1440p is faster than this monitor can display. And of course, 1080p is way faster than this monitor can display. 120 FPS is my ceiling on, on my hardware. And I can basically meet that with all three of these. And I get close a little bit with the 7900 XT at 4K. Okay, it's just a little below 120 FPS, but actually playing the game, it's hard to tell. The performance of Deus Ex Mankind Divided, it's pretty much the same as Borderlands 3. The breakdown is pretty much the same. Toggle the settings, play with some settings. Yeah, yeah, over 100 FPS of 4K. For the performance breakdown, I've also got some artificial benchmarks, 3D Mark, Time Spy, Fire Strike, Fire Strike Extreme, Time Spy Extreme, so that you can get an idea of how this card's gonna break down. But for everything the Time Spy tells you, it's like, oh yeah, you can do over 155 FPS in Battlefield 5. Okay, sounds good, whatever. So, okay, okay. You get it. The gaming performance is there. AMD's got the goods. AMD's got the goods across a whole variety of games going back. You know, there's no weirdness with DirectX 9. There's nothing going on with, you know, DirectX 11 where there's some sort of weird performance regression. 
sometimes over the 6900 and the 6900 XT, there wasn't as much of a performance uplift as I expected, especially at the lower resolutions. It just depends on the game. Uh, and certainly Nvidia was able to get more performance, especially in the Intel platform at those lower resolutions. I mentioned that actually to show how easy it is to go off into the weeds. Like you forget as a gamer, sometimes you just want to enjoy the game. And that's why I really want to talk about the new stuff in the driver. I want to talk about OBS because finally there's good OBS integration. There's hardware AV1 encoding. There's hardware H.265 encoding. And AMD is really trying to dot the I's and cross the T's with their software. But more important than all that, while I still have your attention, HyperRx. If you just want to launch a game and the driver says, oh, you have Tiny Tina's Wonderlands installed. Oh, you've got Battlefield 5 installed. Oh, you've got, you know, whatever. The driver is going to tell you, okay, you've set something dumb. This game is going to perform badly because this is turned on, or this is turned on, or this is a non-optimal setup. What HyperRx does is it turns on the features that you need, depending on what your goals are for visual fidelity or frame rate or whatever for your game, from the driver side of things. So like the little driver control panel, it's like you want to run a, a liquid smooth 120 FPS and that's more important than visual fidelity and you want to run a native 4K, you know, because you're rocking an, an LG OLED display, it gives you one click to do that. That's not here yet though. It's coming in January. AMD was kind enough to share some uh, demonstration B-roll of what this is. Conceptually, you click a button and then boom, it's optimized. And so HyperRx is coming sometime in the first half of 2023, hopefully sooner rather than later. But what is in the driver right now today is the little status thing showing you, okay, this is optimal you know you might have a yellow you might have a green showing that you've got everything turned on or it might be red saying okay you're playing cyberpunk 2077 and you got ray tracing turned up to ultra do you really want to play at 30 fps or 20 fps at 4k with that why don't you let me turn on fsr2 why don't you let me dial in some settings and then just try the game at those settings for a little while and see how it goes you don't have to be an expert and all the little nuances and everything else that goes into this the other thing is that if you want to run the game at a higher frame rate than your monitor supports, that can also negatively impact your input latency, meaning from the time you click the mouse to something happens. And it's kind of noticeable when you have a display that's as fast as an OLED display. The game seems snappier, it seems more responsive. It's really easy to notice this on older games like GTA 5, especially when you're playing it on a really ancient machine, because it's like, oh, it's I'm, I'm underwater. There's you know, there's an ambiguous effect there that uh, feels weird because the game is responding and it's a high frame rate, but it's doing it you know milliseconds after it does on a nicer machine. I don't know, it's hard to explain. All of this is meant to deal with that. So it's nice that we see that on the AMD side of things. And finally, OBS. Whatever weirdness was going on between AMD and the people that do Open Broadcaster has finally been resolved. There's no weird plugin that you have to install. There's no special incantation that you have to do in order to configure the AMF encoder to work properly with OBS. It basically just works. And OBS can actually use multiple encoders simultaneously. So AV1, AV1 is a really high fidelity visual compression codec. It's next generation codec. There's not a streaming service that actually uses AV1, but it's very, very good. But you can capture locally at a very high, uh, high fidelity bit rate. Uh, so that it looks really good. In fact, we use that for some of our cyberpunk capture and everything else um, so that you can really see what's going on. And then you can also stream an H.264. But the software will also use the H.264 hardware encoders that are built into your CPU. So if you're using a 7950X, like I am in my Fractal North test system here, it can use the hardware encoders physically on the CPU, it can use the hardware encoders physically on the GPU. You can use both. You can use both the encoders there to figure that out whatever is a right size operation for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And the AMD driver has had a lot added to it to uh, really make the, those things more accessible to you, a gamer, without being overly complicated. To an extent, AMD is a little bit playing catch up here, but I think that AMD is uh, competing on the merits of their product a little bit more transparently than Team Green. We look at the 4080 launch, and I'm a little bit behind with my 4080 coverage, 
But we look at the 4080 launch and Nvidia sort of unlaunched one version of their 4080. But then just a few weeks later, the reason stated was that, oh, it would be confusing to have two different 4080s that have wildly different performance. And then just a few weeks later, Nvidia launched a 3060 that has wildly different performance than another 3060. Nvidia is capturing as much money as they possibly can, but at least some of that money comes from gamers who aren't willing to uh, really obsess to the nth degree over all of the little details about, oh, do I need eight gigs of RAM or do I need 12 gigs of RAM? Does the RAM needs to be this speed? Should the core be clocked this high? How does this work? If they're not really competing on the merits of the product. They're just saying it's like, I need a 3060 and they get a 3060 and you can have wildly different performance from one 3060 to the next. And the software ecosystem signing into the drivers, stuff like that. No one has ever wanted to sign in to the drivers ever period. Comment below. If you have wanted to sign into the drivers, it's a mild annoyance you're willing to put up with cause you need the features. That seems like a hostage situation to me personally, just say it. AMD doesn't have that. I mean, no Nvidia rant is complete without G-Sync and then FreeSync. And now G-Sync is FreeSync because the original G-Sync was like this crazy FPGA that was wildly impractical anyway. <sighs> Nvidia has a pattern of this behavior. Now the partner versions of these cards are probably gonna be, you know, three, four slots. This, you know, it's, it's, it's Sapphire's teased the vapor chamber version of this. And it's been a while since they've done the vapor chamber thing. But the reference cards from AMD are two and a half slots and they're not super long. And I will probably pick up another 7900 XT for a giveaway or use here at the office or something like that because it's a powerful card. It's two and a half slots. It's not super long and it's not super unwieldy and it has two eight pin power connectors. It's nice. So to wrap it all up, AMD has got the win in the bag in terms of frames per dollar. If you as a gamer want to get the highest end performance per dollar, AMD is the clear winner here. It's not even like by a little bit. It's a, it's a significant margin. Even when you factor in the ray tracing performance of the 4080 and the 4090, right now AMD's got it locked up in terms of value per dollar. The drivers are better than I've ever seen them. The OBS performance is better than it's ever been. AM5 is a promising platform, though it is a little expensive still for what it is. And these cards will perform great on last generation hardware. So maybe you don't need the latest and greatest CPU and desktop computer platform. The graphics part of it's pretty good. So I think AMD's got the win here in, in terms of things that make sense. So congratulations, AMD. Uh, don't forget to finish HyperRX and don't, don't let up on the gas on the drivers. Like the drivers have come a long way. There's still a ways to go in terms of polish and improvement, but stability is there, which is good, I think. At least it is so far in my testing. You know, uh, comment below, engagement challenge. I don't know, let me know in the forum if I'm wrong about that, or let's let's do a deep dive and figure it out. Anyway, I'm Waddle's Level 1. These are my thoughts on the 7900 XT and the XTX, and let's do some more videos. Oh, be sure to check out the Linux video, because these cards, day zero Linux support, mm, yeah, A+. Yeah, AMD's getting their stuff together, they're hiring people, they're figuring it out. It's nice to see. Competition is great. Actually, the playbook, if we look at what AMD has done for the CPU market, they're doing that in the GPU market. RDNA is, uh, you know, NVIDIA is releasing fire-breathing cards like the 4090 because AMD's cards are so good. And, and NVIDIA just can't help but charge too much. I don't know. I'm one of those level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level 1 forums.